Okay, well, today we have actually a bit of a change in plans. Um, Sue is in the hot seat. Uh, I'm Andy Dufton. I'm one of the TAs for the course, but I will get to grill Sue for a change and ask her some of her questions. Um, so start it off, Sue. What's the secret about Petra? Oh, there are many, many secrets about the rose-red city half as old as time. That's the famous poem about Petra. Uh, 1836, John William Burgon, the only other thing he, famous thing he did. But I think of all of them, I would, I would start with what we see here. This is the famous treasury at Petra, uh, El Casne. Tre Indiana Jones, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. When people think Petra, this is what they think, and they look as a treasury. And there's been a long association between this structure and gold riches, as often happens. It actually was a tomb, and so that, I would say you come through to enter this, the site, you see this thing, and the first thing you see, you probably don't get properly. And that's, that's, that's a secret about Petra. The other thing I'd say about Petra is that it is so iconic, this moment, this view, this Indiana Jones. Um, everyone in the world has taken, who's been to Petra takes this shot of this, of, this, of this monument. But actually, it's just the tip of the iceberg that Petra is a very large city, and it had a very big hinterland. And so it's, it's, uh, it's something that I think the project we're working on is trying to unsettle a little bit, the idea that Petra is just a city. It wasn't. That Petra not, you know, was really, in some ways, just this monument. It's not. And how long were people living in Petra? Was it a, a long time, short Ooh. time? It's an inter it, it seems to have really taken off and developed, become monumentalized um, about the 3rd, 2nd century BCE. But there is evidence in the area of uh, prehistoric habitation going back you know, to the Upper Paleolithic, uh, literally over a million years. And are people living there today? Well, it depends on how you define Petra. Okay. Uh, the local Bedouin tribe, the Bedul, used to live actually in the city itself, the ancient city itself. They lived in tombs. They lived in caves. Uh, I've heard some great stories of people visiting, say, 30, 40 years ago, and there'd be like television aerials sticking out of ancient Nabataean tombs. Uh, in the, this became less popular with the, the authorities when Petra became more of a tourist site. It was thought not to be... Uh, you know, great advertisement. Also, it wasn't great for the site itself to have people dwelling in it. So in a slightly controversial, somewhat controversial move in the 1980s, they actually moved the, the, the Bedouin tribe out of the city and settled them in a local village, which actually is where our team stays, as you well know. As since I well yeah, know. As you well yeah. know. And the village of Um Sehun. So people live near Petra, uh, but not within the site proper any longer. So, Sue, you say that Petra has a, a hinterland. What, right. what do you mean by that? What I mean is that when we tend to think about major ancient places or sites, we tend to think about just the core. And, you know, but this was, you know, Petra was a functioning city. People had to eat. People needed water. People needed places to, you know, put their camels and their goats and their sheep. The city needed a hinterland. It needed a region. And that's one reason we decided to bring to Petra not a site-oriented, monument-oriented approach, but to say, let's think about the whole landscape. Let's put Petra in a landscape context. And that, uh, yeah, that, that's revealed numerous secrets. I've done a lot of survey work in my time, but I, I would say this is the most um, modified human landscape I've, I've ever worked in. There is material everywhere. There's signs of human activity everywhere. And a lot of that is owing to the very soft pink sandstone that much of the Petra region is composed of. It's very easy to carve. Um, my co-director uh, says that the Nabataeans were born with sort of a chisel in their hand, and they left their mark everywhere. Um, in the hinterland, you say they're, they're farming, but it's a desert, Petra, isn't it? Ah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty dry, and uh, we work in the summer as well. It can get uh, pretty damn hot. And it is, it is, it's very dry, but what's one of the most fascinating things, and I, let's put this down as a secret as well, is that it's very clear that people in antiquity, and we're still getting the dates squared away, but uh, at some point in the past, people sort of uh, modified this landscape enormously to sort of improve its agricultural qualities. There is periodic rain in this region, winter rain, very intense. Uh, if it's not sort of controlled, channeled, and used, it just flows away. But if you build dams and terraces, slow the water down and capture it, actually this very dry desert can bloom 
And it's clear that probably in the Nabataean and Roman times, that was what was happening. One of the interesting things that we're, we're exploring are these ancient hydraulic systems and whether or not there might be some modern utility for them today. Uh, Jordan is a very water poor country, one of the water poorest in the world. So making archaeology relevant to the present. It is said that uh, when a bunch of British archaeologists wanted to go to Libya, uh, the former leader, Muammar Gaddafi, said, if archaeology is to be done, let it be done for the good of the people today. And he, you know, he said, come and tell us how they lived in this area that we now cannot live in. And that's, so yes, I think archaeology has relevance to, on many levels, the practical and the cultural.